few uh, disclaimers before we begin. One is that we are recording. I made the mistake of posting this on Facebook, and my mother has since begged. <laughs> so if anyone at some point has a question that they do not want on the recording, that's no problem. Just yell, turn the recording off, or whatever, and we'll do that. No, no issue whatsoever. Uh, the second is that I am completely doped on both pain and meds, uh, so forgive me for whatever comes out of my mouth in the next hour. Um, and <laughs> then the third is that at any point, if you want to go grab another biscuit or some tea, or if you need to leave because I'm talking too long or what have you, please do that. Not an issue at all. I will not take offense. Uh, so head out as you will. Uh, for those of you who are James Bond fans, I am sorry for what's about to happen. For those of you who are not James Bond fans, I am sorry for what's about to happen. <laughs> so, welcome to Goose Goose and the Elephant. Uh, you will come to find out why the name is Elephant, Goose Goose the Elephant, later on in the talk. Uh, but first, I wanted to introduce us a bit to our settings and our cast of characters. Uh, so first, we have MI6, also known as King's College London, where I receive my missions. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Department of Geography. For those of you who aren't geographers or aren't British, geography means a very different thing in the UK than I as an American am used to its being. Uh, I would never teach or study in a geography department in the US because it's like, what is a plateau 101? That is not what I do. I have could not give you the definition of a plateau. It's a flat like thing with a hill, I don't know. Um, geography though in the UK means a very interdisciplinary blended look at human environmental relations altogether. Um, so looking at people and place and space and nature and how those all interact and questioning what all those categories mean and that kind of thing. At King's we have both physical and social geography or physical and human as they're sometimes called and the idea is that we try to look at the overlaps between those. Um, some of us do, do more and less um, and certainly that divide is still prominent in academia I would say between kind of looking at earth systems and what the kind of facts of the environment as a, a process uh, or an ecosystem uh, are versus what you know, culture and society around nature or around place and space look. I myself look at environmental peace building in the Middle East and North Africa. So I am interested in how people and groups and countries are using nature to bridge political and cultural divides. Uh, so environmental peace building is not necessarily just conflict resolution over conflicts that the environment caused, right? So we might imagine two countries going to war over an oil resource, right? And environmental peace building would help figure out how to manage that in a sustainable, equitable manner. Uh, but also environmental peace building is this idea that we can somehow use nature as a tool, as a partner, to help solve conflicts that aren't necessarily environmentally related at all. And that there's something special, if you will, about nature that can bring people together. Uh, so I was working with several different groups in the Middle East and North Africa trying to interrogate how and why people are doing that and what it actually looks like. Environmental peace building has thus far, uh, particularly in the United Nations, been a very kind of state-centric governance issue. And I was purposely working with local non-governmental organizations, NGOs, uh, who are doing a lot more kind of community-based work. So the first of those uh, is in the desert of Morocco uh, with Darcy Hamad. Darcy Hamad works in southwest Morocco, Agadir. Uh, on their kind of flagship project is fog harvesting. Uh, so this is a desert. The pretty much only thing that grows there is cacti. Uh, you will see all of the kind of sand and camels and that kind of thing that we stereotypically associate with Morocco, but there is lots more going on. And in particular, uh, there is a big fog cloud system that comes in through the Canary Islands into the Anti-Atlas Mountains, uh, which are some uh, right on kind of the northern border of the Sahara. Uh, and the local people, the Amazi, would call fog water dead water. Uh, they knew what it was, they know that it's water, um, but still traditionally women and communities are walking up to four hours a day to go get water that's probably not really very good um, from a water source, probably waiting for an hour by the well for the water table to rise again and going back. And it's possible to kind of die of, of thirst or of a waterborne disease while you can't see a foot in front of your face because of the fog, uh, which obviously is frustrating and problematic. 
for the communities. Uh, but there's this special kind of pretty simple, actually, technology uh, where you can put nets up in the mountains and as the fog cloud passes through, the water will condense onto the nets uh, and you can pipe it and you know, collect it in pipes and then send it off to villagers' homes. So this local NGO is now collecting enough fog water uh, to pipe potable water to around 400 villagers a day at about 30 liters per person per day, which is really, really a big deal. Uh, they spent 10 years figuring out how to do that and making sure that it would work well. Uh, and that's a long time to be told water is coming and to wait, uh, but they involved the community kind of from the get-go in doing the feasibility study and making sure the fog was continuous enough and wouldn't have you know, kind of problematic impacts. And over the course of that, they ended up building some really strong relationships with the community. Uh, such that the FOG project now has a lot of spin-offs. Uh, so they do a women's empowerment and capacity building trainings. Because one of the things that came up during that 10 years was that, yes, while women are having to walk four hours a day to get water, uh, water is perhaps one of the only material sources of agency, of power, that they have. Uh, you know, and if their husbands are ticking them off, they can say, all right, you don't get water today! Right? Because the women are, are the guardians, this kind of very ancestrally privileged role of water and other resources. And by po piping it right into the homes, this project was actually inadvertently kind of taking away some power for the women. Uh, so Darcy Ma developed this series of trainings and is now engaging the women in numeracy and literacy and looking at what kind of cooperatives would look like for economic empowerment and that kind of thing, trying to make sure that the time that they've saved is now going into gender equality and empowerment programs. They also run a water school uh, where they take students from about L7 to 11 uh, and do a variety of environmental education, kind of using the water as a hook, but doing a lot of girls in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math along with that. And then where the kind of diplomacy part enters in, or the environmental peace building, if you will, uh, is that they use this as a hook to get uh, Western, primarily, research groups into a part of Morocco that is traditionally very underrepresented. Study abroad groups tend to go more north and hear a very particular kind of state uh, endorsed narrative of what Morocco is and here are the cool things that are to study about Morocco and this is what the country is. Uh, and Darcy Ahmad uses the fog to bring people in to a part where frequently people aren't paying much attention and kind of hear different stories and do very serious relationship building in the mountains. And that's their ethnographic field school. Uh, so while I was there, I was spending a lot of time looking at exactly what that means. Shifting over under the sea to Kuwait, uh, I work with a group called the Kuwait Dive Team. Very, very different in nature. Uh, in 1990 and 91, Iraq invaded Kuwait and bombed absolutely everything, including all of the boats that were in the Gulf. Uh, and so there were crashed ships on the bottom of the sea that destroyed coral reefs. Kuwait and the Gulf, the um, Persian Gulf actually, and the Arab Gulf have beautiful, beautiful coral systems. Um, they're not you know, generally thought of. <laughs> we think of Australia and that kind of thing, uh, but really, really beautiful places for diving and incredible marine ecosystems uh, that of course are very dependent uh, and have other ecosystems dependent on them. Uh, so this group of amateur scuba divers wanting to do something to help rebuild their country uh, after the war was ended started teaching themselves essentially how to do salvage and went and picked up a bunch of boats and have now lifted over 600 boats <laughs> from the Gulf. Uh, and the war is pretty much cleaned up now, but they found that they had completely fallen in love with volunteering, which is not something that is culturally native, shall we say, to the Gulf, or common given current uh, economic systems within the Gulf, thanks to all of the oil and gas. Uh, but so this group of, uh, of divers found that they had loved volunteering and they really, really fell in love with the sea and wanted to do something uh, to protect it. So they've become this massive volunteering group that take 200 Kuwaiti school kids to the beach every week uh, and do a lesson on why our oceans are important and how we can protect them and then do a community beach cleanup and that kind of thing. They also do what I've named diving diplomacy, uh, where they're invited by other countries to come help them pick up boats and things, because it's a very, very specialized niche skill set. How to pick up a boat that's buried under the sea is, is you can't really go get a master's in that very easily. Uh, so, so they go and train with other dive teams about how to do that and help other groups do conservation work, which is quite fun. And then to the unfortunately almost still burning <laughs> Lebanon, uh, which is 
post-war, but also kind of in war, depending on how you look at it, uh, is the Media Association for Peace. This was the most kind of theoretical of my three research partners in terms of what they were actively doing. Uh, Lebanon, I don't know how much we know about Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon has had several periods of civil war, is currently internally officially at peace, uh, but part of the way that happened was a massive power sharing agreement between a lot of um, religious and ethnic sects. Uh, there are like 28 different confessions or sects in Lebanon, um, and everyone belongs pretty strongly to one of those, which then transfer into political parties. Uh, and even each of those political parties has power over some kind of aspect of the government. Uh, but how it ends up working uh, in actuality is that the country's kind of stuck in peace, if you will. Um, so they've managed a government that doesn't go to war with itself, uh, but it also doesn't really govern very well either, because um, they're just they're too busy not fighting to figure to actually do <laughs> much in the terms of um, actual proactive development and that kind of thing. Uh, so the Media Association for Peace works in the media sector. Like pretty much everything else, there is no independently owned or operated media in Lebanon. All of the news sources are affiliated with one of those confessions or sects or political parties. Uh, so there's no kind of like BBC or any kind of objective observer or reporter going on. Uh, so this group of young journalists are advocating for how do we better do this. The media can be this really powerful platform for bringing communities together and sharing and making sure voices are heard. That's not currently happening. How do we do that? Both as individual reporters and systemically. And they had a particular program on during the months that I was there on environmental media, especially looking at how do we do environment and development. Uh, you may have seen headlines around the rubbish crisis when Lebanon's... Um, Municipal workers went on strike, and there were lots of issues with several uh, closed down waste dumps, uh, and so there was just trash, heaps and heaps of trash everywhere, like in the middle of the road in Beirut, the capital city. Uh, so they got a lot of kind of momentum from that, uh, and since I've been looking more at, you know, how do we see the environment as something that is tied to peace, and how do we talk about that in the news. Uh, so there are my three groups. Uh, but no narrative would be complete <laughs> without a Bond girl, and I promised that I would explain to you where the couscous the elephant is coming from. Um, so, Bond girl number one is my beautiful blonde bombshell of a cousin, Effie Mekis, who came to visit me in Lebanon. No, sorry, in Morocco. Uh, she's currently a bus in Lebanon. Uh, so Effie and I go out to the souk, which is this beautiful outdoor market full of a lot of crafts, all kinds of cool uh, handmade works, beautiful traditional items and that kind of thing. They're really, really fun places to just go out and explore and see what you see. In addition to being um, often like basically the main grocery store, so you also can get produce and all kinds of things at these markets, as well as stray kittens, who are always fun. <laughs> like, I felt like that was important to include. Uh, so Effie and I find this great stall with beautiful handmade lanterns and we have a good probably hour-long chat uh, with the guy whose family has been making these lanterns for generations and we talk to him about his craft and we choose some lanterns to send off to friends for gifts and that kind of thing. And then as we're wrapping up, Effie and I mention, oh, and we're wanting to buy some scarves. So this very sweet elderly gentleman takes us over to his friend. He is about 26, and there are no photos of the encounter that's about to happen. Uh, <laughs> and Effie gets really excited and starts looking through all of these scarves, and there are just colors and colors and colors and colors and colors, and it's grand. So Effie's looking through all these, uh, and, and the vendor comes over to me and says, is this your sister? <laughs> no, no, it's my cousin. Oh, she's very beautiful. Yes, yes, she's, she's very beautiful. I will give you 400 camels and 40 Ferrari for her. <laughs> no, sir, I'm not going to sell you my cousin. <laughs> Although, looking back, that's a lot of money. I really just should have done it. Uh, um, anyway, so I deny him the sale of Effie. She's kind of continuous, uh, continuously, obliviously looking through scarves. And the next thing the gentleman does is physically grab my stomach, grab a fat roll in his hand, and say, is this too much couscous or tagine? Now, for those of you who don't know, on the right is couscous, uh, a really, really good rice kind of dish, uh, grain that's made of the base that goes on all kinds of things. On the left are a big heap of tagines. 
Tajin is actually the cooking kind of instrument or style rather than a particular food. Uh, people will make all kinds of things in there, often actually couscous. Uh, but you, you can go order a tagine of chicken or meat or whatever um, at a restaurant. Uh, so I was slightly affronted slash thinking in my head that, sir, this is not how you make a good sale. I mean, you know, trying to buy my cousin and then call me fat, but oh well. <laughs> But I went and I told this story to my research partner, the staff at Darcy Maud. They thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. And they now call me couscous around the office. So there's the couscous. But to get to the elephant part of the tale, we need blonde girl number two. This is Christina, uh, who is my dearest friend in Lebanon and the project coordinator for the Environmental Media Project at the Media Association for Peace. And one day we're sitting in the office eating lunch and pretty much out of nowhere, Christina, and by the way, I was eating a salad, just for the record. <laughs> Christina says to me, Becca, you eat so much, you're going to be an elephant. <laughs> okay, thanks, Christina. Um, so thus, Couscous the Elephant was born. Um, and I feel like this really needs to be some kind of children's animated series um, about an elephant that either goes around the Middle East having adventures and or has serious body image issues. I'm not sure which. Um, but a few lessons to learn from Couscous the Elephant. One is that taboos are different around the world and cultural norms, right? And what is and is not okay to talk about. Um, it, is completely variable across. Uh, and certainly these two incidents were not at all the only times when I had people telling me I was fat, I was skinny, often as they were actively putting food on my plate and that kind of thing. Um, and it's, it's not an insult. It's just, you know, it is rainy. You are fat. You know, I mean, <laughs> there's really not any kind of normative association with it per se. Uh, but of course, as someone who grew up as a female in America, uh, that took a lot of processing. It just move on, move on, move on. So I can't tell you how many of my research notes are things like, I got called fat again today. Oh well, moving on. Uh, so you will encounter things that feel strange to you or you think shouldn't necessarily be happening. But also, you will say things that are taboos to them, right? You, you, as a researcher or as a tourist or whatever, you're going to screw up. Uh, and that's going to be okay. Uh, the best thing that you can do is laugh about it and just roll with the name Couscous the Elephant or things of that nature. Uh, but also, I think we can learn from both the Couscous and the Elephant part of this uh, when we're doing research. So one is that food matters uh, and food has value. And like nature, food can bring people together. Uh, and this is something that I think we all kind of know and we enjoy, right? We take our mates out for, for drinks and for meals and that kind of thing, but also can really, really be used as a tool in research in building relationships and saying thank you and that kind of thing. Uh, so, and also just getting more data, frankly, more information about the place that you're working in. Um, so some of these are me eating, which is not helping the kids use the elephant narrative. <laughs> this is also Christina eating, I would just like to point out. Um, this one is me eating cactus honey in the rural mountains of Morocco. You have not lived until you've had this. And there's a special kind of honey that they collect that, from the cacti fruit. So it's this really spicy, sweet, and it's amazing. And this was like honeycomb they literally picked probably 30 minutes before. Utterly amazing. Uh, this is me actually volunteering at a food bank, not that you can tell, um, as I make a happy lettuce. Um, and then also Effie exploring the English pub in Agadir, world famous. <laughs> Not what you all would consider a pub, I will say, uh, but a place you can get alcohol, which is exciting for the area. Uh, but more importantly, the meals that I sponsored for my research groups. I built into my research budget uh, as part of the day that we were all together in a focus group, so a, a group conversation about my research issues, uh, a community meal. And this is something that at first the whole NGOs were like, no, 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 you don't need to do this. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Like, it's, you know, we have to do this. It's part of our office hours or whatever. And like, no, 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 no. I need you all to sit down and have a meal with me. Uh, and one, it's just a, a thank you. I recognize that as a researcher, I am taking up time and attention that they would otherwise be doing what's productive for them, right, um, as they go about their work. Uh, and then also kind of continue, themes that weren't brought up in other discussions come up here, dots get connected, that kind of thing. 
And I would say a lot of what I'm saying is more on kind of human geography or sociology or anthropology in terms of methods wise. But this is one that I really would recommend for any physical geographers as well when you're doing field work. The people who are out there randomly collecting bugs or holding instruments or whatever people do for you when you're in the field, <laughs> uh, no matter how small their contribution are, uh, take them out and like have the whole research team together. Uh, for Morocco, my focus group was the first time that their entire staff had ever been in the same room together. Uh, and that was huge for them, actually, as an organization. And I was able to, because I built this thing into my budget, um, and be able to support some of their travel to their, the office, because they weren't always based in the same office, and that kind of thing. And it was something that was a nice payback, and they were able to have a joint staff meeting as well. Uh, but this, these kind of meals were just so, so fun, and really do bring up things that wouldn't otherwise necessarily be there. Uh, so that's the couscous element of couscous the elephant. And the other one I would say is be aware of the elephant in the room. Uh, this is especially for those of us who are doing more kind of discourse, conversation, theme-based research. Uh, but things that are being said, of course, are information. And while you're doing interviews or you're observing things on the streets or whatever, it's very easy to take note of a sentence that someone says or what a sign reads or what have you. But what is not being said is every bit just as important as what is being said, and sometimes more. Uh, so one example, I guess, from each of the places. Uh, in Lebanon, this group called the Media Association for Peace uh, who did not mean peace with Israel, right? Uh, and Israel was not talked about. That was not on the agenda. That's not what we mean by peace. We're looking at internal peace. We're looking at perhaps Palestinian and Syrian refugees, that kind of thing. But no, 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 not Israel. Uh, and of course, as someone who is looking at the region as a whole and who's also interested in international relations, I wanted to talk about Israel, and Israel was important, and how can you be a peace organization that isn't, you know, like, trying to also have peace? Uh, but that was not part of the mission, and that was a major elephant for them, and I, there were some people that I was able to talk about Israel with, and I did, I had those conversations, sometimes in a more off-the-record manner than others, but there are also people for whom that would not have been an appropriate thing for me to push on, and they are never going to bring it up, and it would not, frankly, be fair. Uh, of me to try and get them to talk about that because uh, it's just not what they do or it comes with a lot of public censure from them and that kind of thing with their communities and their families. Uh, so it's a lot of kind of feeling your way, of course, and there are questions that you do want to ask. Uh, we're based in southwest Morocco over with Darcy Hamad, so very close to that border with the Western Sahara, which is or is not Morocco, depending on who you ask. And Darcy Mott is one of the NGOs closest to that border, and they don't do the Western Sahara, right? And, and in any map, there's this big question of like, do we or do we not include this line, and where does it get put, and that kind of thing. And again, I have to be really careful about when I do and do not talk about that, or who I try and get me to give information about that. And it would not be appropriate for me to ask it to, you know, like some low literate woman in the community, but I can go ask the ethnographic field school manager back in the office, you know, to maybe shed some light in, in terms of what she would guess or would see, um, and just know that that's where that kind of information is coming from. Uh, and then in Kuwait, uh, obviously, perhaps um, not what we would necessarily associate, this environmental group working in the land of oil production. Uh, and massive, very cool environmental volunteering projects while we are drinking out of plastic water bottles and pouring them away by the goat, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, but of course we all have tensions with that, right? And we're all hypocritical with moments and that kind of thing. So these issues will happen and the elephants in the room are important and need to be talked about and are something that you should analyze in your papers or talk about with your supervisors and that kind of thing. Uh, and there are also moments that can help create very cool conversations um, and deepen a relationship with a research partner or perhaps break a relationship with a research partner, depending on how. Um, so I guess I would just say be cautious with the elephant and when you do or do not decide to publicly notice him or her. Uh, okay, so moving on from Couscous the Elephant and getting to what is this ridiculous James Bond uh, theme running through this talk. I am not a spy. I am not a spy, I am not a spy. Uh, I am, however, an American who speaks random amounts of Arabic and knows a lot about the Middle East and North Africa 
and grew up as a pastor's daughter in a farm village and somehow randomly is in Kuwait, which is not a tourist country, and how what? Uh, so this is the first and only time I have ever held, or probably ever will hold, a gun in my life. Uh, it's a recreational shooting range in Kuwait. Part of what you do when you do kind of more anthropological or ethnographic fieldwork is do pretty much whatever your host family tells you to, uh, which includes all forms of interesting entertainment hours. Um, I, can't, I don't know how well you can see this target. It's not bad for someone who's never held a gun. Uh, for that, You can probably tell I'm not the most graceful of people. That's why I'm on my crutches after having fallen down the stairs of my own house while sober. Um, I, you know, athleticism is not really a thing I do. There's a reason I make my living with my brain. Uh, but the target was decent, and then we also at the same time did the outdoor thing with the flying discs or whatever, and I hit that on the first time. Uh, so Nora uh, then went and told the family these stories, and that I was really good, and they made me bring out my target at dinner, and they all exclaimed over how on target it was, and yada yada. Uh, and then, of course, the, you are a spy, I knew it, I knew you were in the CIA. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not a spy. Uh, but of course, you're walking around recording everything, and you've got cool cars. <laughs> yeah, and the point is that people are not necessarily going to get why, why you're there. Right? I mean, in the US and the UK as well, I have to explain to people what a PhD is. What am I actually doing with my day-to-day -day life? Right? And what am I trying to do when I'm going to all of these random countries? Am I not just per kind of perpetually on holiday? Um, so, it, including the people who you're researching and talking with and interviewing, quite likely not really going to have an obvious frame of reference for what it is you're doing and why you have all of these random gadgets. Uh, for me, the solution to this well, partial solution. I'm sure there are still people in Kuwait who think that I'm a spy. Um, but partial solution to this was actually the research uh, ethics and uh, consent process, uh, which for anyone who ever has ever done research with humans, this is a pain in the butt. Uh, it's um, like pages and pages and pages of paperwork, and it has to get you know authorized by a central group, and you have to explain exactly who you're going to ask exactly which questions and that kind of thing. And it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of thought and sometimes it kind of blocks you into less flexibility when you're working with groups. This is especially true if you're working with children or any kind of perceived to be disadvantaged or marginalized communities. And of course it's there for a reason, to protect people because science has done horrific things to humans in the names of knowledge. Uh, and we do of course need to check ourselves. But it's a really awkward process and has become quite bureaucratic. Uh, and it tends to be kind of the bane of someone's existence, uh, especially when you're in the field work and you've just had this really, really cool conversation with someone on a bus and you really, really want to include a quote and then you realize you can't because you didn't do consent and they didn't know that you were there as a researcher and it's totally not fair grabs what, you know, that whole 40 minutes of pure gold information was. But uh, what we can do when we have interviews is there's this like information sheet and consent form and depending on how you've done it they have uh, like the person who you're interviewing has to check a bunch of boxes to say yes I understand that you're using my information and this can be quoted and you can use my name or you can't blah 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 and sign their life away which is very daunting for people who aren't really a very paper based society or don't work in English or that kind of thing and you can do some translations, there are some options to do it verbally and that kind of thing, but still just like this awkward, very institutionalized process. Uh, but for me, I found that it was a way to then introduce people to what the heck research actually is, I and mean, kind of the history of what anthropology and the Western University has been and why I'm doing this and the purpose of my study and what I'm trying to get from them and what I hope they're getting from me. Uh, so those became, instead of the obnoxious like check the box, thing, uh, kind of 15 minute often conversations. And I was only doing like 25 to 30 minutes of interview. So this was like half of the time of the interview was our conversation around research ethics, which obviously is a big investment of time from everyone, but honestly meant that people then left a lot more aware and okay with what I was doing and perhaps hopefully slightly less convinced that I was a spy. Um, and then I, the other thing, and then I'll wrap up that I want to say, and this, I again think, really does apply to all field work and work that it happens uh, in geography and in any discipline. Uh, that getting involved is not somehow polluting data, it is producing data. 
Uh, and there's a very big debate, <laughs> which I stand pretty strongly on one side of, um, about how and why a researcher you know, is in the space or if we are objective and unbiased and that kind of thing and how we can see information. Uh, but the presence of a random white body in southwest rural Morocco is influencing things. R regardless of what I'm doing in the room, if I'm sitting in a corner silent, just watching, that is actually, I would say, changing things even more than if I'm in the middle of the room dancing and making a fool of myself. Uh, and I really found that the more participatory, the more engaged I was, the more comfortable people were with me, the more willing they were to tell me things, and then also, Things came up that I would never have thought to ask. Um, so just a few moments uh, of what this looked like for me, and of course, I'm happy to chat with anyone who's interested in doing, or you know, planning to do field work on how they might do this. Um, sometimes that's celebrating with the women of Morocco um, about one of their capacity buildings. Sometimes one of these dots, I'm not sure which one, is me under the water helping to lift a boat. Probably the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Uh, I'm not like a full scuba diver by any means, uh, but I, I cheated just enough to help get this boat um, out of like, I think 12 meters or something of water, uh, where it was doing a lot of pollution and causing a maritime hazard, uh, which was very, very awesome. Uh, sometimes it's interviewing live on Kuwaiti national television. Okay, for like an hour. This is not like a three minute, what are you doing here? Okay, great, back to you in the studio, Bob. No, this was like, tell us the entire history of the Kuwait team and your whole project and what are you doing and what should we do to you know, help with environmental issues and that kind of thing. I was like, ah, uh, which was very, very fun. Uh, and sometimes it's helping to organize a conference. Um, they ran the first conference ever in the world, explicitly looking at the interaction between environment, media, and peace. And of course that was really, really cool to be a part of. And on, in all of these things, uh, and I would say especially in the ones that are explicitly conversations when they're thinking of topics or how they talk about nature and peace, I'm kind of you know, walking this tightrope between, I'm here to figure out what your idea is, not tell you what mine is or change yours. Uh, but one of the projects that MAP asked me to do for their uh, conference was help with an infographic and write up the script for what environmental peace media is. It's like, oh, no, 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 you guys have to tell me. Like, I can't do this. And they're like, no, 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 we need you to do it. Like, you're the expert on environmental peace building, go. Uh, so I kind of very hesitantly wrote up this script and sent it off to some people. And the pushback that I got on that was actually way more telling for me about what they thought of as environmental peace and environmental media than if I just asked them to find environmental media for me. Like, so much more good little nuggets in there. Um, so you, you, you don't know, right? and, and you're going to be changing things, and you're going to make mistakes. And yes, something that you do is going to impact the work that the organization or the community that you're in is doing. But that's not necessarily, and I think it's not at all, usually a bad thing. Uh, so research matters. And specifically, you as the researcher matter, and are making a difference. And of course, the communities that you're working in matter. Um, so I would encourage you all to do it intentionally. Um, go in knowing that you're going to make a difference, that you're going to mess up, that you're going to build friendships that have nothing to do with research, uh, and that kind of thing, um, and, and do it heartfeltly um, and with real purpose. Uh, just a final few moments. Uh, one, thanks to my M, <laughs> Naho, <laughs> who is at least slightly more terrifying than Voldemort sometimes. <laughs> Um, and also to my cue, this is Marwan, who is the office manager at Darcy Mod, which was the first of the organizations that I worked with, where I learned, and that was my first kind of official, formal, on my own field work. And I've learned so, so much from this man. Uh, he's definitely my cue in all ways, and it's also his birthday today. Uh, so <laughs> happy birthday to Marwan, and he'll see this on Facebook in about an hour. Um, anyway, so that is all from me formally. I'm very, very happy to do more photos share more stories, answer questions, and that kind of thing. And thanks very much.